begin by bringing forth young Amanda Graham Hugo. Um, in the march, there was music was very important to them. Um, I had a song that I made in Mahia Jackson saying how I got over, um, but I think the song that um, Amanda's going to do for you will give us a, a glimpse of some of the things that help help the, the people who took that journey. Um, so Amanda, please. Hello, hello. Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Amanda Graham and I am a senior here at Wagner College. And um, as Curtis Wright said, the song that I'm about to sing for you guys is called Can't Give Up Now by Mary Mary. And it's kind of, I guess you could say, a gospel song, but it's really about empowerment and, you know, never giving up. So hopefully you guys really listen to the words and grasp what it's saying. And, you know, carry it on throughout the school year because we'll need that. Um, I'm supposed to have accompaniment, but he's not here right now, so I'm doing it a cappella. So bear with me. If I tell y'all to clap, I want you to actually clap and stay on beat. If you know you can't stay on beat, just, you know, just do it in your head. You can do that for me, okay? It'll throw me off a little bit. Okay. <laughs> There will be mountains that I will have to climb and there will be battles that I will have to fight but victory or defeat is up to me to decide but how can I expect to win if I never try? I just can't give up now. I've come too far from where I started from. Yeah. He's brought me this far to leave me. Never said there wouldn't be trials. Never said I wouldn't fall. Never said that everything would go the way I want it to go. But when my back is against the wall, and I feel the hope is gone. I just lift my head up to the sky and say, help me to be strong. Oh, I just can't give up now. I've come too far from where I started from. He's brought me this far to leave me. I know you didn't leave me out here to leave me lonely. Even when I can't see clearly, I know that you are with me so I can't. I just
Sabrina Slater, and I have the honor of serving as your chaplain intern for this fall semester. Um, I also have been charged with giving the invocation for this evening. Um, invocation, big word. Uh, it's a verb meaning to call on, to invoke, to give. So you can consider it perhaps an opening prayer. Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a reverend. He was a preacher, a real preacher, the kind of preacher who spoke not only with authority, but with relevancy. He saw the world as it was, made comments, but also saw what it could be. This man allowed his voice to speak truth to power, seeking to dismantle the injustice shackling the very soul of our country. His dream is so powerful because it is our dream. It is undeniable this dream changed the world, and yet it resonates so deeply because the fullness of that dream, that simple dream of freedom and dignity, has as of yet to be fully actualized. Dr. King walked up to the pulpit of each of our hearts and gave a sermon that was heard around the world. Today, as I walked around and I spoke with people and listened to people, I heard something incredibly profound. Somebody said, I just don't want to get used to this. I just don't want to get used to this. The invocation for tonight is a request. May we be disturbed. May we be uncomfortable in the presence of injustice. May we continue dreaming until indeed we see the glory of the Lord that can only be revealed in love. The kind of love that just does not let us get used to this, to death of any kind. For indeed, injustice is to allow the death of the dignity of a fellow sister, brother, mother, father, daughter, son. May we be uncomfortable in the presence of injustice. Amen. Amen. I hand this over to President Dr. Grassi. Thank you, Sabrina, and thank you, Amanda. Did she had the she had the class. Um, how many of you were at the noontime event? So some of you were there. Okay, I'm um, good. Not about half. Um, the reason I asked is because I didn't want to repeat something I said there, but <clears throat> maybe I, I will repeat it. Uh, listening to Amanda, let me roll back. In 1963, I was a freshman going into college in August. I was going in September. And so uh, I relate to the first year students who are here now in the sense that uh, I was where you are. But it was a very different world. Uh, at uh, the institution that I went to, Amanda wouldn't be there. And I went to a Catholic Jesuit institution. She just wouldn't be there. Uh, the world has changed. The Civil Rights Bill moved us. It hasn't completed by far the journey, but it bent history for America and changed the direction. Uh, in 1963, we lived uh, in the South in an apartheid state. Uh, what we now call African Americans, what they were calling Negroes, uh, were people who were not allowed functionally to vote, were lynchings, it weren't an occasional, they were an often occurrence, where folks who, poor people who were, um, didn't read or write, were prevented from going to school, took it upon themselves, with some inspiration from leaders like the ones you saw on, on the screen, poor people, illiterate people, took it upon themselves to find the courage to march down together, non-violently, think about this, non as a philosophy of non-violence, to gain their rights, and this came on the heels in 1963 of something that started in the early 50s. We tend to date it to the bus boycott in Montgomery, but it actually preceded, preceded that. And uh, it was a movement for social justice. But Dr. King, as I said this afternoon, and this is what, what makes Dr. King so extraordinary, was he first of all saw the necessity of gaining for people the rights that they deserve to vote, to, to assemble, to speak, to become American, full American citizens, to have jobs, to have hope and prosperity. But he also realized he created a vision of a good society for all people of all races, and today we would say of every different difference, what I call gifts, what makes us unique, 
and our own identities, of everyone together, fully equal, fully engaged, fully respectful of one another. So he, he gave white people, as well as them who were considered white and black, as well as black people, an image of what a good society would look like. He had that great quote that I used this afternoon of, in the speech of I Have a Dream, um, and he said, I hope that my four children will be not judged by not, not by the color of the skin, but by the content of their character. That we could get to a place where, it, where, where all these differences would be acknowledged, but wouldn't be determinate in terms of justice and resources and opportunities. And we would learn to respect and love each other. And the last thing I'll just say, uh, two last things I'll say as a way of introduction for this marvelous evening, was that Dr. King, and this, again, I was just rereading the speech and so, many, so much of his work, wanted to liberate the oppressor as well as the oppressed. Now think about that. Think about the vision and the moral standing of that. That he felt that the oppressor was as trapped in the system of injustice as was the oppressor. Different, different experience, for sure. But he understood that, that they had to free both. And who else said that? Nelson Mandela says that in South Africa years later. That we have to free the oppressed and the oppressor from a vicious system of injustice. Brilliant moral kind of beacon right uh, as, as a man. The last thing I'll just say to you, just to sort of link us to our own history here, I didn't have the good sense or knowledge to come to Wagner College. I went to another school in New York, uh, and so I didn't know about Wagner College. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and I didn't really know much about it. I would have come here if I would have known about it. I believe I would have had a better experience. But um, in 1963, I learned this from alums who I've met uh, since, and I was surprised because, you know, we were Wagner Lutheran Memorial College. I think we were just called Wagner College. Then. We were still a Lutheran school, even though the large majority of students were not Lutherans. Large, large majority. But we were, you know, we were, we were a school that had a, a, a spiritual mission, is what I'm saying. And so in 1963, the ministers who worked here, there were two or three chaplains and what have you, they put together several buses and a number, a number of Wagner students went down to that march and marched on that day. So there's a footprint between that generation of Wagner students and this generation of Wagner students. And it's a footprint we should acknowledge and honor. And I thank the folks who put this together tonight. This is a very, very important evening. Thank you all for being here. The little, little mighty might of our campus here. And I don't know how she's going to get over this. And I don't know where this podium came from. This may have come from the March in Washington. I don't know where the regular podium is, but here's Lily McNair. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Good evening, everyone. And again, yes, I echoed President Garasi's thanks, sincere thanks and gratitude to the organizers of this commemorative event. This group of people reflected a cross-section of our community, students, staff, and faculty. Thank you all for your commitment and your vision so that we could honor Dr. King's legacy and the 50th anniversary of this historic march on Washington, which has been described throughout the years as iconic, as pivotal, and as we heard earlier this evening, as the psychological crescendo of the civil rights movement. The actual March on Washington for Jobs and Freedoms, the program which you have in your hands today, was and in the first time a group of Negroes assembled this capacity in the nation's capital at the Lincoln Memorial to address issues of job, freedom, and civil rights. One thing I know as a psychologist is that context is always important. And the context, the immediate context, of this historic march was that a few days prior, the pro there were significant protests in Birmingham where police unleashed dogs and dem onto demonstrators there. And this kind of was the, an ongoing situation in the South when demonstrators, nonviolent demonstrators, fought for their rights. The organizers of the, the march knew that discrimination in housing and employment opportunities within the school system, all of these types of discrimination had to be eliminated before, quote, the Negro can ever begin moving up the highways of freedom. The organizers of the march knew very clearly that freedom was linked to jobs, 
access to housing, access to education, access to voting. That context still holds for us now, 50 years later. In some ways, the context seems eerily and unfortunately reminiscent of the, that original call to action. And yet in other ways, there are some dissimilarities, which for many are quite striking. The struggle continues now in the areas of voting rights, still continues in terms of housing and employment discrimination, racial profiling, comprehensive immigration reform, and related to voting rights, voter identification laws. The resounding theme earlier today in Washington, D.C. was that the struggle must continue. In order for us to advance the dream, the fight must go on. As Amanda said, we can't go back now. So in order for us to advance the dream, a call to action is appropriate. We know that Dr. King's dream is the dream of many, that his vision as Representative John Lewis, one of Martin Luther King's colleagues and a speaker on the original program, Representative John Lewis of Georgia said on Saturday, Dr. King's vision includes everyone. We are one people across all of our different differences, across, of our, across our gifts, our diversities, our commonalities, our dissimilarities, across our abilities and or orientations, across our colors, our gender. We are all one people, and we know that injustice for anyone means injustice for all of us. Thank you all for being here and lending your energy and your commitment to this important event. Let's continue to work toward advancing the dream to fulfilling Dr. King's vision. standard there and an example of progress that Dr. King worked so hard for and, and we are so fortunate to have you with us. And another amazing individual that we're fortunate to have with us is Dr. Rita Reynolds. Dr. Dr. Reynolds is a standard bearer for us on campus. She is a professor in the history department. She chairs the Expanding Horizons program so that she can make sure that when we leave this institution and, and, and interrogate um, injustices and, and, and information in other places that, that is done properly, you know, we call her a teacher, we call her a mentor, uh, but the most fortunate book is called a friend, call her a friend. So please join me in bringing Dr. Dr. Rita Reynolds here. She can take a short perspective. that by 1963 was overwhelming. It wasn't simply a movement for African Americans, but it was a movement that asked all Americans to take part to address this notion of inequality. If you were a student and you lived in the North and you were white, you were asked to take part in this march. If you were a poor sharecropper who lived in Mississippi, you were asked to come and take part in this march. If you lived in Kansas, you were asked to take part in this march. A lot of people during the time knew a little bit about the discrimination, knew a little bit about the inequality that African Americans had experienced, but unfortunately there weren't classes that they could take to learn the whole process, where it began, why it was so pervasive, why African Americans were so angry and willing to put their lives on the line for equality. This thing that was central to the way white Americans saw their existence in the United States. This notion that the Constitution protected your rights, African Americans did not experience it. 
But we're going to go back to 1863. For anyone who's taken any of my classes, you know that many of them deal with the issue of slavery. We don't have time for that. But we will talk about what happens when slavery ends. One of the things that is amazing about this March on Washington is the idea that it celebrated the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. In 1863, President Lincoln authored and signed the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing almost 4 million slaves residing in the Confederate States. While his actions were largely symbolic, Northerners and Southerners alike understood the moral victory Lincoln's document represented. It would take another two years to end the war between North and South and amend the Constitution to formally and finally abolish slavery. In December of 1865, Congress adopted the 13th Amendment, ending slavery in the United States. I wonder if in two years we're going to have another celebration, right, for truly the formal legal ending of slavery. Actually, I would like to see that. I'll be here. <laughs> African American men, women, and children who resided in the slave South for the first time experienced freedom. Freedom meant the right to own themselves, their labor. They were free to choose who, where they would live, who they would labor for, who they would marry. After almost 250 years of bondage in first the British colonies and then the United States, they could legally name their own children without the fear, fear of seeing a family member or loved one sold away on the whim of a slave owner. With the end of enslavement and the beginning of radical reconstruction brought with it citizenship rights, the 13th Amendment was not enough to guarantee that. In 1870, African American men, since women at this time did not get the vote, women would have to wait almost 50 years before that would occur. Um, African American men could for the first time cast their vote and run for office, and office they did. African American men voted in overwhelming numbers, entering the voting booth at a rate of almost 90% compliant. Could you imagine if, in fact, at our last election, 90% of our population cast their votes? as citizens, this was seen as a privilege and also an obligation, something that we don't see today. During Reconstruction, the time after the Civil War, blacks were also allowed to educate themselves and their children. Here too, from the very young to the very old, African Americans attended school, most in one room dirt floored shacks, to learn how to read and write so they could make decisions that had been denied them under slavery. The free people also created and attended religious services, no longer required to attend church with whites who used Christ to reinforce racism and slavery. Blacks opened AME churches, Baptist churches, Episcopal churches, to name a few, to worship the Christian God who delivered them from slavery. This American racial revolution of sorts was short-lived, and with the end of Reconstruction and the, end, the exit of federal officials and troops from the South, blacks were once again at the mercy of their hostile former masters and poor whites who did not want to see African Americans given racial, political, or social equality. From 1877 to 1954, African Americans were denied their most basic citizenship rights. The Supreme Court ruling of Plessy versus Ferguson in the 1870s institutionalized the doctrine and legalized the doctrine of separate but equal. With it, southern states were given the right to legally discriminate against blacks in housing, education, voting, employment, and in other public accommodations, including transportation and dining, but not exclusive to those two. The vote was categorically denied African Americans and with it, the right to have a say in their legal rights. Those who challenge white rule could face mob violence and experience lynching from an angry white mob. Black children were denied formal education by white controlled, by white controlled educators who held the purse strings of local schools. 
blacks were dedicated to the most demeaning employment opportunities. Some Southerners, <laughs> Southern black men who obtained form, formal education or college education as lawyers or other professionals were not allowed to apply their trades and found themselves working on the railroads as porters, seeing to the needs of whites. Actually, this is really the Pullman porters were, in fact, uh, slaves uh, in certainly in uh, formally, they were not legally, they were not slaves, but in fact, they were. Uh, unlike, uh, excuse me, unskilled black men and women were forced into debt peonage as sharecroppers, who after a year of laboring for, white, for a white landlord were cheated out of their fair wages. At the end of the year, black sharecroppers found themselves in deeper debt than when they began. Historians, um, and I find myself included in this, like to make neat packages out of history. And so for most, the argument is that the modern civil rights movement begins in 1954 with the Brown decision, but in fact, it had been going on since 1877 with the creation of the NAACP in 1909, and other organizations that were designed specifically to challenge the inequality that African Americans face. But for our purposes and for time, we will argue that one of the defining and early moments of the civil rights movement is the 1954 legal decision by the United States Supreme Court that formally ended separate but equal in education. The Brown decision determined that separate and equal was in fact not equal and that African Americans were denied the constitutional rights. There was no place, quote, for racial discrimination in education. Later in the next year, 1955, a young Martin Luther King, Jr., a minister and an unlikely and unwilling one, became one of the leaders of the Montgomery Bus Boycott, which was one of the first organized grassroots movements that boycotted city buses in Montgomery, Alabama that humiliated African American riders by requiring them to sit in the rear of buses or stand over empty seats so whites, white riders could, stay, could enjoy their ride in comfort. <clears throat> With this creation of a formal grassroots movement headed by poor, uneducated, middle class, educated, men, women, and children who are African American, majority of whom lived in the South and faced the daily humiliation and discriminatory practices, decided that it was time to make a change and that this movement, for them, would either see a change or it would end in their own death. Faced with Klan violence, cross burnings, bombings, firings, and other acts of, int of intimidation, African Americans stepped forward to fight for their citizenship rights. So I'm going to end it here. And I think that uh, a number of other people are going to begin to address this notion of what uh, the March on Washington uh, did, uh, what it meant, and uh, its members. But this is just a kind of overview of what, by 1963, African Americans were challenging and fighting against. This movement for civil rights did not just happen in the South. Money to help the protesters fight discrimination was poured in from the North and family members who were former residents of the South to help create a change, to see legal restrictions lifted, political restrictions, but most importantly, voter rights, to register African Americans to vote. Um, and so we'll go from there. Thank you. Perfect. Arrested over 40 times and brutally beaten during the civil rights campaigns, John Lewis was the youngest and most radical of all speakers at the March on Washington. Invited to represent the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or the SNCC, Lewis's remarks bespoke greater faith in grassroots movements than in the White House. In consequence, 
The 23-year-old speech was censored, but remained powerful in its call for revolution. A six-time senator, and the only still living speaker at the march, he remains respected by Republicans and Democrats today for the faith in the beloved community. Darnell uh, will share with us a few lines from Congressman Lewis's address. We march today for jobs and freedom, but we have nothing to be proud of. For hundreds and thousands of our brothers are not here, for they are receiving starvation wages or no wages at all. My friends, let us not forget that we are involved in a serious social revolution. By and large, American politics is dominated by politicians who build their careers on immoral, on immoral compromises and ally themselves with open forms of political, economic, and social exploitation. There are exceptions, of course, and we salute those. But what political leader can stand up and say, my party is the party of principles? To those who have said, be patient and wait, we have long said that we cannot be patient. We do not want our freedom gradually, but we want to be free now. We are tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. I appeal to all of you to get into this great revolution that is sweeping this nation. Get in and stay in the streets of every city, every village and hamlet of this nation until true freedom comes, until the revolution of 1776 is complete. complete. For in the Delta in Mississippi, in Southwest Georgia, in the Black Belt of Alabama, in Harlem, in Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, and all over this nation, the black masses are in the march for jobs and freedom. We will not stop. We will march with the spirit of love and with the spirit of dignity that we have shown here today. We must say, wake up America, wake up, for we cannot stop and we will not and cannot be patient. While well, women stood side by side while women stood side by side with men at the protest and sits, they were not always provided with the opportunity to be seen as leaders. That history tells us they were. One particular leader was Josephine Baker. Baker is remembered by most people as a flamboyant, as the flamboyant African-American entertainer who earned fame and fortune in Paris in the 1920s. Yet through much of her later life, Baker became a vocal opponent of, seg of, segreg of segregation and discrimination. Often initiating one-woman protests against racial injustice, in 1963, at the age of 57, Baker flew in from France, her adopted homeland, to appear before the largest audience in her career. The 250,000 gathered at the March on Washington. Wearing her uniform of the French Resistance, of which she was active in World War II, she was the only woman to address the audience. Becca will share, the expert, will share with, her, with us excerpts from her speech. Friends and family, you know I have lived a long time and I have come a long way. And you must know now that what I did, I did originally for myself. Then later, as these things began happening to me, I wondered if they were happening to you. And then I knew they must be. And I knew that you had no way to defend yourselves as I had. And as I continued to do the things I did and to say the things I said, they began to beat me. Not beat me, mind you, with a club but you know I have seen that done too. But they beat me with their pens, with their writings. And friends, that is much worse. When I was a child and they burned me out of my home, I was frightened and I ran away. Eventually, I ran far away. It was to a place called France. Many of you have been there and many have not, but I must tell you, ladies and gentlemen, in that country, I never feared. It was like a fairyland place. And I need not tell you that wonderful things happened to me there. Now I know that all you children don't know who Josephine Baker is, but you ask Grandma and Grandpa and they will tell you. You know what they will say. Why, she was a devil. And you know something? Why, they were right. I was too. I was a devil in other countries and I was a little devil in America too. But you young people must do one thing, and I know you have heard this story a thousand times from your mothers and fathers like I did from mine. I didn't take her advice, but I accomplished the same in another fashion. 
You must get an education. You must go to school and you must learn to protect yourself. And you must learn to protect yourself with a pen and not the gun. Then you can answer them and I can tell you, and I don't want to sound corny, but friends, the pen is really mightier than the sword. I am not a young woman now, friends. My life is behind me. There is not too much fire burning inside me. And before it goes out, I want you to use what is left to light that fire in you so that you can carry on and so that you can do those things that I have done. Then when my fires have burned out and I go where we all go someday, I can be happy. You know I have always taken the rocky path. I never took the easy one, but as I get older and as I knew I had the power and the strength, I took that rocky path and I tried to smooth it out a little. I want to make it easier for you. I want you to have a chance at what I had, but I do not want you to have to run away to get it. And mothers and fathers, if it is too late for you, think of your children. Make it safe here so they do not have to run away, for I want you and your children to have what I have. So for a couple of our brilliant students, but right now I want to bring up some of our most amazing faculty, beginning with Dr. Larry Weintraub, Dr. Cyril Ghosh, Dr. Stephen Presco, and bringing back to the podium, Dr. Rita Reynolds. I would say too that Dr. Presco, this is really, really his brainchild. He came to us and said, we've gotta do something, we must do something. And, and as a leader, not only at this institution, but all around the country, I was sitting in a dissertation defense proposal at the University of Pennsylvania, and when they quote Dr. Presco in their defense for why they're writing their dissertation, you know he's done something spectacular. So I really want to publicly thank Dr. Presco for his leadership. And his amazing voice for his We are much, much better for the And they are very flexible. We had a different set of panels coming forward, and, and that panel is, those panels had to back out the last minute, and they graciously um, offered their support here today. So they're gonna come forward and give us an amazing panel. So my remarks are inspired by the speech you just heard from John Lewis. And and it's and it's specifically focused on what 16 to 23 year olds accomplished during the march on Washington, um, particularly John Lewis, who was 23. But it's a comparison, a little bit of the goals of youth then and the goals of youth now. Um, in a way that I hope you will really be able to connect with. And before I start talking about John Lewis, I just wanted to reference someone a little closer to home and in some ways less nationally significant. He wasn't one of the big six leaders of the march. He didn't speak on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. He was just an ordinary 16-year-old uh, who had gotten involved with the Congress of Racial Equality, one of the uh, many organizations that was fighting for civil rights. Uh, in the 60s, and like many of the young people and uh, people of all ages across the country for the March on Washington, he took it upon himself to come to Washington, D.C., and in this case, this group from Brooklyn actually walked to Washington, D.C., from Brooklyn, starting off by taking the, uh, the uh, ferry from 69th Street, which some of you may know was before there was a Verrazano Bridge and therefore landing in Staten Island, not far from Wagner College and continuing on his journey. And so I think it's a really important reminder of how everybody, how important it was that ordinary people, ordinary young people participated. He wasn't just, um, he wasn't just involved on that one day. Um, he was actually involved with picketing a hospital in Brooklyn which refused to hire African Americans. There were similar problems on Staten Island um, well into the 70s, um, also in relation to schooling, and also in relation to shopping, where African Americans could shop at certain stores on Staten Island, but were not allowed to try on the clothes before they purchased them. And so there was also a Congress of Racial Equality on Staten Island that um, Dr. Reynolds and I had the honor of interviewing some of the leaders of that group. 
Um, but again, I, just like I hope you noticed from, um, from the speech that John Lewis gave, that the priorities of young people are a little bit different than some of the themes that have been remembered in history in the March on Washington. Um, it wasn't just about you know, brotherhood and interracial uh, connectedness, as much and as important as that is, but that there really was a focus about jobs. It really was about fairness and equity. And so when we judge the March on Washington and whether or not it accomplished its goals, we have to really judge it for what it meant to the people who were involved and not just three or four lines from Martin Luther King's speech, however beautiful and eloquent they might be. Um, and so one of the speakers at the March on Washington, um, John Lewis, the youngest speaker and the only surviving speaker who's now, um, we're fortunately able to still hear him speak. He spoke today on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial about what to do to continue Martin Luther King's dream. He was arrested 40 times. He was one of tens of thousands of young people who were arrested during the sit-in movement. Um, Professor Reynolds kind of um, stopped right before we got to how the grassroots movement spread from the Montgomery bus boycott to the, the sit-ins, starting with freshmen, um, freshman college students, um, some of the leaders in Nashville, sophomore college students, um, these were young people who were willing to, both black and white, sit at counters, get beaten by mobs, get arrested by the police. In the 10 weeks before the March on Washington, there were 20,000 arrests. So when young people came to speak at the March on Washington, they had something different in mind. They had in mind that their friends, or themselves, had spent significant time in jail, and that the federal government had not done anything to help them step up against the state governments that were arresting them despite their nonviolent protests, despite their, their, ability, their, their wish to try to change society through nonviolent protests. And so John Lewis was one, is, as he is today considered one of the most important of these speakers. He wrote out his speech. He was said to be one of the 10 speakers on the platform. He had already met with the Kennedys. Some people in SNCC were a little bit suspicious of the march and it being co-opted, and yet they wanted to be included, and they put out their speech, his speech the night before to make sure the press could get a hold of it. But when the Kennedys got a hold of it, and others who were on the panel, they threatened to withdraw if he didn't change his speech. So um, actually, despite the title, March for Freedom and Jobs, um, and despite the idea of the First Amendment of free speech, his speech was heavily censored. He was actually literally rewriting it um, while the speeches had begun on the platform of the Lincoln Memorial. He was in the back room with a typewriter and three or four friends, and he didn't want to change anything. Um, but Baird Rustin and Philip Randolph basically said, we worked too hard for this day to start having some of the uh, white speakers pull out of the, you know, of the schedule. You have to change a few key things, like his call to wake up to a social revolution, um, like his pronouncement um, about the federal government, which side is the federal government on? Who, you know, where does Kennedy really stand? Because it's three years into a Kennedy administration and there still is no civil rights bill. Kennedy had only come to office with half a percent vote. He was walking a fine line to not alienate Southern Democrats. And what was going on behind Jackie Robinson, who was there at the March of Washington, would say, you know, what was going on behind those closed doors between the Kennedys and those governors of those Southern states? Um, other things that were omitted from John Lewis's speech, and he's third from the, third from the, left. you're left. Um, uh, we cannot support the administration's civil rights bill. It is too little, too late. For, there's not one thing in the bill that will protect our people from police brutality, which was a big issue in the civil rights movement. So he really had to recraft his speech. And although the words are incredibly powerful, I think, I mean, I hope you all felt as moved as I did when the student w was reading them, right? To start off your speech, not like Martin Luther King by referring to, you know, 100 years since emancipation, we still have so much more to go, but to say, you know, that we, we can't be proud of being here, right? That's a pretty strong statement of criticism for where America was in 1963. 
And um, just if you're interested in leadership, John Lewis went on to lead sort of the seminal uh, march uh, across the Selma Bridge, which is sometimes credited for the passage. Not only the Civil Rights Bill had been passed, but didn't have enough meat to uh, ensure voting rights, and so there was the need for the passage of a voting rights bill, and he faced extreme police brutality, so much that there had to be a second march, um, and, and he marched alongside Martin Luther King in that march that led to that passage. Um, here he is today as, um, as a congressman with a co remarkable sort of, uh, I think, consistency in his concern about uh, children and youth, um, starting from the day, you know, when he reflects on his childhood and that first trip to the public library where he and his cousins are turned away from a state-sponsored institution, to today, he says, you know, the signs are gone, but there are invisible signs. It's a call to ask each and every person, what invisible signs are buried in your heart that might be creating a gulf between people across differences? Um, so, um, not to only be critical of Martin Luther King, I thought I would include something that is not often quoted from his I Have a Dream speech, um, which is also his call for the more, for the less sort of sweet sounding words. Um, we all remember the last line, justice rolls down like water, but how many of us remember his call against police brutality, against the limited social mobility of African Americans, um, against the, the lack of faith of African Americans, whether in Mississippi or New York, in their government. And so, as John Lewis said, where is the political party that can make it unnecessary, both then and now, to march on Washington? Where is the political party that can address these kind of things? Um, another great leader, youth leader, Bob Moses, um, almost single-handedly responsible for bringing thousands of white college students to Mississippi in 1964 to register voters, um, and today very active in education rights, making the argument that algebra today, that math skills today are as important as voting rights then. You know, this is a, this is a quote that he wrote this past weekend in um, the newspaper about what would Dr. King say today. Um, and saying, you know, basically we still allow Jim Crow, maybe not in public transportation, but in public education. So think back on your own experiences with school. You know, are they truly integrated? Do they reflect the rainbow? Um, you know, do you know of schools that are equal, that have unequal resources, tracks, school books, science labs, and so on? And I thought it had a resonance to the only woman who actually spoke at the March on Washington. She spoke 142 words, about five sentences. This is one of them that I thought was really beautiful. We will walk until we are free, until we can walk to any school and take our children to any school in the United States. You know, can we say that that has happened in 2013? So I think these are really great questions. Um, there's a really interesting map I came across. It actually, I don't know if any of you know of this, it's from the University of Virginia. There's a little dot for every single, every single person in the United States um, in the census. And you can zoom in by block by block to see what kind of segregation there is. Blue stands for white. I think it's green is African American. This is New York City. You can sort of see Staten Island. And you can see that there's still plenty of separation between races, so I think John Lewis and the other youth leaders would want us to say, you know, what still needs to be done? Um, just like they were critical of the Kennedys and the government and um, even their, you know, the, the traditional black leadership, you know, what's the next step? What can young people do? Um, you know, we are the agents of change. So I hope that that will, you know, sort of inspire some of you to think about, you know, what's the next steps you want to take to make Dr. King and everybody at the March on Washington, all quarter million of those people, to help make those people and their grandchildren's dreams um, come true. Thank you. I sort of want to build just a little bit on what Lori said and then talk about somebody who wasn't honored at the March on Washington but should have been. Um, 
Some of the goals for the march that I think we've forgotten include eliminating segregation and promoting educational justice. But there was a very specific call for a, a $2, $2 an hour minimum wage. That was part of the March on Washington. A $2 minimum wage, by the way, today would be over $14 an hour. Uh, we're pretty far from that. We're at, we're at $7.25 an hour. So on that basic economic issue of a minimum wage, which is tied to so many other issues, we have not done well. The single best way to address the problem of hunger in this country, we now know it, is through a higher minimum wage. And yet we haven't had the will to move there. The single best way to actually to deal with widespread poverty is to raise the minimum wage. So on, on these economic issues, on jobs, I was looking at the budget of the Labor Department in the United States. It's in the $10 billion to $13 billion range. That is a drop in the bucket of the federal budget. And the Labor Department budget is now far less in proportion to the whole budget than it was years ago, certainly under Lyndon Baines Johnson. So again, another place in the area of jobs where we just haven't made much progress and have so much more work to do. But I want to take a few minutes to mention someone who wasn't featured at the March on Washington. I believe she was there, but I'm not positive. And her name's Ella Baker. Ella Baker was one feisty, tough leader. And the leaders of the civil rights movement tended not to like her very much, tended not to want her to give her a really strong leadership role. And yet, of the big six, of the big six groups, that helped organize the march, Ella Baker had a strong relationship with four of those groups. Probably was more versatile, more accomplished, had more experience than any other leader, male or female, who was at, who was at the March on Washington. So think about the big six. We've got A. Philip Randolph, representing the sleeping car porters. We've got Roy Wilkins, whom we saw up there, uh, representing the NAACP. We've got, uh, we've got John Lewis representing SNCC. We've got, um, who's the guy who represents? Urban League, huh? No, not Russell. Farmer. Not Farmer. James Farmer's core, and then uh, the Urban League. I'm just yeah, not remembering it. Whitney Young. Whitney Young represents the Urban League. Um, of those organizations, Ella Baker, and, and then, uh, of, of course, <coughs> Uh, of those organizations, Ella Baker had strong relationships with a number of them. When she was an activist in New York in the 30s, she became the head of the branches of the NAACP, the leading organization for civil rights in the United States. And the head of branches meant that she went to all the local branches all over the South and sometimes in the North, checking up on them, finding out about their progress, really beginning to learn the, the grassroots issues around civil rights. And she did that for years. Not long after that, she associated with CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. And they did some very early freedom rides. Long before the freedom rides of the 60s, they were doing freedom rides in the 40s. Baird Rustin was part of that. A, a number of other people, James Farmer was a part of that. But Ella Baker wanted to go on those freedom rides. She wanted to take her life in her hands because they were very dangerous as we know what happened to people on the Freedom Rides, again and again, people like John Lewis had their heads busted in. But, but Ella Baker wanted to go, nevertheless, but they just simply wouldn't let her go because she was a woman. So she was barred from doing that, but that was a strong commitment she had. In the 50s, during the Montgomery bus boycott, there's a group called In Friendship. They made sure that the Montgomery bus boycott had the money they needed to keep going. Who was in charge of In Friendship? Ella Baker and Baird Rustin again, and Dr. King's good friend, whose name I'm not going to remember, who is, who is also there as part of In Friendship. The first executive director of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the organization that Dr. King founded after the Montgomery bus boycott, the first executive director is Ella Baker. She like so many of these other leaders, is playing a significant role in keeping the civil rights movement going. So we've got the NAACP, we've got CORE, 
we've got the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And maybe most of all, Ella Baker is there in North Carolina to help found SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the group that John Lewis would become the head of. Without Ella Baker, SNCC doesn't happen. Without Ella Baker, SNCC is informed. There isn't the invitation to bring the students there to create this amazing organization. And without Ella Baker, the students don't get to have their own organization because there were other leaders there who wanted to take it over, who wanted to absorb it into other parts of the movement. There was always conflict in the movement. And, and this was another one of those conflicts. But Ella Baker, with the, in collaboration with the students, was able to keep SNCC strong and separate and to continue to have a really strong impact on the civil rights movement, in some sense culminating with the March on Washington. So Ella Baker, a person who goes completely unrecognized at the March on Washington, in many ways is the most accomplished leader there. And I guess I'd like to think that when it comes to women's rights and recognition of women and, and allowing women to rise to the highest possible positions, this is an area where we've made a lot of progress. But it's people like Ella Baker quietly doing their work, doing, taking on leadership position after leadership position who helped make that possible. I want to say two, uh, uh, two things, basically. The first thing is short, and it's something that I um, believe, I like, and I want everyone else to believe, so I'm going to try my best to indoctrinate you, so that's going to happen. <laughs> the second is a list of grievances. I want to actually point out, um, on this solemn occasion, how, how far we have not come. And I understand this is a day of celebration. It's 50 years. It's also 150 years since the Emancipation Proclamation. But there's so much work to be We keep saying there's work to be done. The president loves to say there's work to be done. Exactly how much work, or what the nature of the substantive content of that work is, I want to point out a little bit of. But I want to begin by asking a question. How many people, what percentage of the people at the March of Washington, on Washington were African American, do you think? Guesses. Actually, something like that, about between 75 and 80 percent, which then means that at least one-fifth of the people there were not American blacks. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I think no identity politics-based movement can succeed without solidarity with others. It doesn't have to be only racial solidarity. Men fight for women, native-borns fight for immigrants, Straight people fight for gays and lesbians. All kinds of people fight for others. It's a very important lesson, I think. But that's the only sermonizing I will do for now. <laughs> Breathe again, yeah. Um, am I loud enough for people at the back? <laughs> Isn't my class. <laughs> Um, I, I'm plagiarizing from Tim Wise's website. Tim Wise is an essayist on race relations, and he writes on affirmative action and various other things. And uh, this report, this blog entry basically came out in the summer this year. So the data is relatively new, but not like from yesterday, right? But I do want to point out a few things, and stop me if I'm, if I'm going for too long. Uh, the first thing I want to say is, um, oh, did I mention this is all about inequality, right? So the, uh, and in a sense, these are about the invisible signs, the invisible Jim Crow that we have right now. Somebody talked about invisible signs, yeah. Laura, you did. Right. Um, American blacks with college degrees are nearly twice as likely as comparable whites to be out of work. Okay, that's the first thing. Same thing for Latinos, but not quite as bad. So they have a 50% more chance of being out of work when compared to whites with college degrees. Asian Americans who have college degrees have also a 40% more chance of being out of work than comparable whites. White Americans who claim that they have criminal records, they're still more likely to be hired 
than, uh, higher than equally qualified blacks who do not have criminal records, right? Uh, when you com combine blacks and Latinos and look at enrollment in elite colleges, they make up about 13% of the population. Of the total population of the United States, they make up about how much? What percent? 45? I don't know that much. Was, no. 30. It's like 28, I think, is around what it is, right? So they're severely underrepresented at the elite institutions, and this is the best they can do because elite institutions actually have decent affirmative action. Other places don't. So this is not very happy news, I think. Wealth gaps between whites and people, people of color, they've actually tripled since the 1980s. Tripled. The typical white family now has 20 times the net worth of the typical black family, 18 times the typical net worth of a Latino family. When you compare the families of middle class and uh, middle class blacks and whites, uh, whites possess three to five times the net worth of middle class blacks. So even within that subgroup, it's bad news. I can go on and on. The typical black or Latino student attends school with twice as many low income students as the typical white student. We know this, some of this is familiar. They're also twice as likely to be taught by the... <laughs> right. They're also, they're also twice as likely to be taught by the least experienced teachers and half as likely to be taught by the most experienced teachers. Companies routinely fill up, their, uh, fill up, up to half of their new jobs by way of recommendations made by pre-existing employees. This disproportionately favors whites. And this is not from this blog, but Tim Weiss says this in another context. If your name sounds black, you have a 50% higher chance of not being called for an interview, for a job interview in this, in this country today. Um, even in work settings where uh, black Americans are, uh, comprise most of the, the high, uh, high percentage of workers, in the managerial positions, we almost never have black Americans representing, represented. They also experience lower mobility when compared to similarly placed whites, and they've play, they, they, of course there's regular harassment on the job. Some guy I was talking to at a, at some, a friend's birthday party uh, two Saturdays ago, he said that, you know, I keep getting to, he's black, and he said he works for a hedge fund, and he says people tell me things about the way I speak, that I'm too rigid, I'm too uptight. What he's really saying is that they say that you sound too white is what the problem seems to be. Now this, as far as he's concerned, and as far as I'm concerned, is just harassment. Harassment for no reason at all. I mean, what's the idea? But they keep, they, he keeps getting told this at his workplace every day. This is downtown Manhattan financial sector, right? You wouldn't expect this to happen there, but it does. Anyway, I, there's many more. Uh, just a couple more. Uh, um, Black children are twice as likely to die in infancy as white children in this country. Black teenagers have unemployment rates that regularly hover around 40% and are 2.5 times the rates for white teenagers. If you grew up in a black family in, in this country at this time, your parents would have been twice as likely to be out of work when compared to white families. And three times as likely to be poor when compared to white families. And finally, if you had committed a crime as a youth, you'd have been six times as likely to be incarcerated for that crime than if you were white. It's a long list, and I plagiarized. So if you want to actually see the blog, send me an email. It's not that hard to find me. I'm on the government and politics website. I'll send you the web link if you want to know more. I just want to say that it's since we're taking stock, it's kind of important for us to know that we live in quite a racist society. And uh, it's bad for many people of color, but it's especially bad for black Americans, I think. So while we're celebrating it, we should also pause and be, be sad, I think. 50 years is a long time, right? We haven't come that far. Yes, we don't have you know, rules about getting up and giving your seat to a white person on a bus, but still, it's not all positive.
Sí. So after all of this, I, I don't think we have any time for my comments because it would just be too long. Um, but I think that my colleagues have really kind of summed it up. Um, you know, this idea that um, that the March on Washington was a milestone for American society, right? To be able to say that we as a community of Americans could go to Washington and vocally express our feelings, our opinions, stand up. Our opinions about the way African Americans were treated without fear of being molested um, or run, run out of DC, um, I think is significant for the time. Um, I agree that we still have a long way to go. Um, but I think that one of the things that we're doing right right now is the opportunity to learn about these movements, right? To be able to say that we as a community on Wagner are willing to make a change, whether it's through civil engagement or civic engagement, whether it's through education, right? By teaching students about what it means to be a leader, right? By using those young leaders from the civil rights movement who spent their time not in classrooms, and I, I'm not saying you shouldn't come to class, but, <laughs> um, but by going out during summer break and going down to Mississippi, right, and getting paid something like you know, $2 a week to help African Americans who were poor and uneducated, right, who were intimidated, who were afraid of losing their jobs if they spoke up, to go down and help these people vote so the change could be made. That is significant, and that is a lesson that we can still learn today in a society where, when you look at unemployment, African Americans are almost, what, tri double, triple what whites experience in terms of employment when the economy goes south. When we have a mayor in New York City who really believes that stop and frisk is the right way to go, that racial profiling is acceptable in 2013, we really do have a long way to go. And I think that it's these types of things, right, where we're able to sit and talk about what happened and why we still need to go forward. Uh, a couple of years ago, SNCC had their 50th anniversary at Shaw University in North Carolina. And some of these people that we talked about who are still alive, a lot of the kind of unnamed, unknown student workers were actually there. And I got to tell you, these people were amazing. A lot of them who were in their 60s, you could see they were really suffering from the beatings that they got when they were younger. Some of them were in wheelchairs, others were using, others were using canes. I mean, you could see that these people were suffering because of the beatings they got at the hands of the Klan, and yet not one of them had any regrets about going down to Albany, Georgia, about going down to Birmingham, Montgomery, and other places. Not one regret. If they had to do it again, they would. And there was this one point where um, we, there was a presentation on the Freedom Songs. And they were playing a video clip of um, a group of uh, workers singing. And all of a sudden, the audience, with all of these former civil rights workers, right, started singing these at the top of their lungs. All of a sudden, they were back in 1963. They were there. And I have to be honest with you. I was way too young to have experienced any of that. But sitting in that audience, it was very emotional. And I started to cry. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, if this is just a little bit of what these people experienced, it must have been an amazing time to sacrifice everything, in many cases, for someone you didn't know. So that's something, I think, a lesson that we can take forward. Right? We can create our own history by showing that we're still interested in equality and helping those who can't help themselves get their citizenship rights.
panelists. Are there any from the audience? No? Too distracted. <laughs> so I will, because you know the whole theme of our. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, um, here. So we are talking about core and SIG and SCLC. So I'm just wondering, where are we today? Like I've heard, obviously, of NAACP meetings and, and that, but I haven't really heard of these organizations. Are they still trying to tackle the invisible issues that exist? And are they trying to recruit student newcomers to join the organization? I'm just wondering if they still are present. The Urban Leagues still very much around, and as you said, the NAACP, there's definitely no SNCC, right? Uh, uh, SNCC is, is really an administrative is that right? uh, body. I mean, they still um, do minimal things, but they are not the kind of force that they were in the 1960s. I mean, SNCC kind of splits. They expel uh, the white members, and part of the leadership goes towards black power. And the Panthers, so I mean, they really haven't been a functional organization for quite some time. And the SCLC right. still, still goes around, on. Pretty, pretty much this function. But it's a great, I mean, it's, you know, as a theme, uh, you know, where, where are the, the activists similar to the activists of that time? It's a good question, and, and um, I don't know if we can name really active organization other than? NWC. Well, I think as NWC. individuals, many of them are still around. They're, they're writing. Uh, they're telling their stories. Um, so a lot of sort of local civil rights history from uh, people who were members of SNCC are actually in the pipeline. So the, the scholarship is coming out right now. I think that for them, as they're, some of them are in their 60s, others in their 70s, it becomes very important for them to tell their story. Um, and so I guess maybe, you know, for them, that is the kind of logical next place to go. But I think most of them are still very active in their local governments, taking part in making changes. Um, and, and I would imagine that since the, the Voting Rights Act, you know, has pretty much been dismantled, we'll hear from them again. I want to say, I know this looks like a transitional moment, but you don't want to miss the music that's coming in a minute. But I wanted to say that um, one thing that came out of the struggle was that a lot of colleges and universities, especially beginning in the 1970s, started to have black studies and institutes for black uh, arts or black literature or, or just black studies in general. And I think a lot of it, it reached another phase, which was a, a more institutionalized where the leadership would train up other people and it stopped being at the national level of activism, it started to be more of a, um, just a, a something that was slightly more in the mainstream and part of uh, academic institutions and other things. So I think some of it kind of morphed into that. So I, I agree 100% with you. Uh, when I was a student at the University of Massachusetts in Black, black Studies or African American Studies program, of the six or seven founding members of the department who were all professors, um, all of them, except for one, were members of SNCC. So, you know, as I said, now they're in this place where they're writing their stories, um, but also, you know, teaching people like myself and others who are coming after me, um, you know, what it meant to be a civil rights activist and how, how to be one. Another question, I hesitate, I, I hesitate to speak. Um, but I just feel compelled to say something. Um, I think uh, a lot of the national, we're in such a desperate, dark moment, no pun intended, dark moment uh, politically, where we don't trust politics, that so much of the move for social justice has moved to what we call civic engagement. And civic engagement is different than political engagement. It's akin to it, but it's different. That civic engagement is about bringing us, in, us here at the college into the lives of people in communities that are challenged and people of need, and working together with them as, as legitimate partners. So it's that same notion of partner that Cyril was talking about. But it's building a democratic culture, building a culture of us, of not me, or how we're different, but rather how we support each other. That's an interesting moment. It will be joined inevitably by a political movement. 
uh, of, of, of some proportion, particularly as the demographics of our society are changing so dramatically. But this is an important pre uh, precedent and an important um, precedent to that political movement because when that movement comes back, we will have much greater unity across the things that separate us of all the identity issues and all the other kinds of issues, immigration and so on and so forth, we'll have so much greater sense of respect for one another and experience with each other. That's the important thing. Experience with each other, learning from each other, and building a better politics when that comes. I want to, I mean, there's this natural conversation around them. Is education worth the cost? I think what you know tonight is that if you are taking in their classes is worth every single penny. These are some of the most amazing and prolific academics you'll ever meet. So please join me in thanking them for. He's going to talk to you quickly about some some of the journey here, and I'm going to bring forth the band that's going to entertain you. Please don't get, get up and leave. It's going to take about three minutes. But, um, um, I lived in Latin America for a long time. I lived in Costa Rica. And while I was in Costa Rica, um, the Nicaraguan Revolution happened. And uh, this was something that was a change that was a long time coming. Um, you had this dictator um, uh, who was had oppressed his people for 25 or 30 years. And the way that this movement happened was that um, a group of musicians um, wrote music that would be performed in communities and even in churches, and it became the folk music of people. And this music brought about a consciousness that brought about this change. And, and this slow kind of wave grew and grew and grew until it became absolutely inevitable that Samosa would be overthrown. Um, Something much more akin to what happened in the United States uh, happened in South Africa. Uh, Nelson Mandela was deeply inspired by Martin Luther King, who had been inspired by Gandhi. Um, and uh, the movement, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, which was also uh, not only a movement of blacks, but of sympathetic whites, but primarily of black people in South Africa, led eventually to throwing off this system of racial separation there was a tremendous body of amazing African choral music and folk music that grew up around this movement as well. Uh, and, and folk music, I think you'll find throughout the ages, has, has at times been something that has bound a nation together, given it identity, and given movements voice. Um, if you were at the Oval at noon, I was talking about Pete Seeger. Um, Pete Seeger was a song collector and a folk musician. And, uh, he, he worked with the United Miners, he worked with a number of groups, and he would unite people in song. Folk singing was a very big part of American life in 1963. And uh, among the people that, that were present um, at, the, at the Lincoln Memorial on August 28, 1963, were Bob Dylan, I think you've all heard of Bob Dylan, who uh, had risen up in the folk music movement, but was pretty much known as a protest singer as well. And uh, with him, his one-time girlfriend, Joan Baez, who, by the way, was born on Staten Island. And whose father taught in the physics department. Yes, there you go. So there's a real strong wider connection with uh, 50 years ago today on the Lincoln Memorial. Um, well, uh, Bob Dylan had written a song, uh, Where Do All the Flowers Go? What's the name of that song? Um, it's Blowing in the Wind, Blowing in the Wind. And this was a song that questioned uh, a number of things, including the, the racial climate in the United States. There was an amazing African-American singing star named Sam Cooke. Sam Cooke came up like so many uh, fine black singers, singing the lead voice in, in gospel quartets. And um, he decided, like many people, like Lou Rawls and a number of other people that did the same thing, to cross over into a solo career that was an R&B type of career, but that was also crossing over in that, um, what was it, film, Dream Girls, you know, that, that was crossing over to a white audience that wasn't restricted to a black audience, but, but reached a much wider mainstream audience. But when Sam Cooke heard Blowing in the Wind, he was absolutely convicted, and he felt like he had to do something, even if it put his career at risk, 
to express what he felt about was what was going on racially in the United States. And so he wrote this song. It's a song that um, was actually not his biggest hit while he was alive. He died very un untimely, unfortunate death right after he wrote this song in 1963. He died in 64. But this has become almost an anthem. Um, the song is called The Change Gonna Come. And uh, in it, he, he creates a whole atmosphere of, of uh, his, his culture, of which he's so proud, and then he sings uh, this hopeful verse, and a change is going to come. I'm so pleased that uh, we're able to have uh, this wonderful band, uh, Steve Babino, who graduated last year, Anthony Babino, who graduated in, in 09, um, Steve Agro, who's still with us and will graduate uh, next year, and Ernie Jackson. Don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> who is an alumnus and is uh, a great friend of our college and department. And um, the one and only Dorian Lake who will sing for you. Um, and we also thought we'd throw in uh, People Get Ready while we're here. So, you want this? Um, anything else?
hurts me feels. People get better. it is unlikely that the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom would have happened. As with so many of the events that shaped the civil rights movement, including the Montgomery bus boycott and the perilous freedom rides to integrate interstate buses, Rustin was the mastermind who pulled the strings behind the scenes. Again and again, he was the man who made things happen. In the case of the March on Washington, Rustin was responsible for ensuring a peaceful march, for working closely with the police, and for deciding who would have the privilege of speaking before such a vast audience. The March on Washington is fondly remembered as one of the most peaceful and highly effective demonstrations in American history. Bayard Rustin deserves a lot of credit for that. But at the time, his leadership in organizing the march was largely hidden. He had three strikes against him. For one thing, he was an openly gay man at a time when homosexuality was criminalized throughout most of the United States. Rustin was actually arrested at least once for engaging in homosexual activity. Second, he was affiliated with the Communist Party before World War II and always held political beliefs that placed him well left of the center. His brief flirtation with the communist movement cost him dearly well into, into the 1960s. Finally, and perhaps most dramatically, he was a pacifist who, for reasons of conscience, refused to serve in the military during World War II. From 1944 and 1946, he served in Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary, where he also organized protests against racially segregated facilities. Wherever he went, and however much he was punished or marginalized, he stood up for justice. 
It was Bayard Rustin who helped Dr. King turn the Montgomery bus boycott into a triumph for Gandhian-style nonviolent direct action. It was Bayard Rustin who risked his life twice riding buses throughout the South to draw attention to the injustices of racially segregated public transit. And it was Bayard Rustin who worked closely with Dr. King and President Lyndon Johnson, who brought both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to fruition. Like King, he was a drum major for peace and righteousness. He is remembered for the idea that the, be the best lives are lived by those who stand up for what is best in all of us. When, and this is a quote. When an individual is protesting society's refusal to acknowledge his dignity as a human being, his very act of protest confers dignity on him. Next, we will have an excerpt of speeches he gave later in light to connect gay rights to basic civil rights. Today, blacks are no longer the litmus paper or the barometer of social change. Blacks are in every segment of society, and there are laws that help to protect them from racial discrimination. The new niggers are gay. It is in the sense that gay people are the new barometer for social change. The question of social change should be framed with the most vulnerable group in mind, gay people. The Stonewall Riots were the beginning of an extraordinary revolution similar to the Montgomery bus boycott in that is was not expected that anything extraordinary would occur. As in the case of the women who left the Russian factory and in the case of Rosa Parks who sat down in the white part of the bus, something began to happen. People began to protest. They began to fight for the right to live in dignity, the right essentially to be oneself in every respect, and the right to be protected under law. In other words, people began to fight for their human rights. Gay people must continue this protest. This has been an amazing evening for us, and, and this has been just the last, last couple of days, been really, really um, heavy on us. Um, I know that Many of you are very sad and are very emotional, and I want us to celebrate. Had Justin been here tonight, he would have been here on this panel, and he would have been leading this next one. So I will close with words from Phil Brindolph, who happened to be a, one of the most prominent um, black unionists on, in, the, in the movement. So at the march, he was really credited for, for the leadership of the march, and he began by saying, we gathered here for the longest demonstration in the history of this nation. Let the nation and the world know that the meanings of our numbers, we are not a pressure group, we are not an organization, or a group of organizations, we are not a mob. We are the advanced guard of a massive moral revolution for jobs and freedom. This revolution reverberates throughout the land, the touching every city, every town, every village where black men are segregated, oppressed, and exploited. But the civil rights revolution is not confined to the Negro, nor is it confined to the civil rights for our white allies. Know that they cannot be free while we are not. And we know that we have no future in a society in which six million black people and white people are unemployed and millions more live in poverty, nor is the goal of our civil rights revolution merely the passage of civil rights legislations. Yes, we all want public accommodations open to all citizens, but those accommodations will mean little to those who cannot afford them. Yes, we want a fair employment practice act, but what good will it do if profit-geared automation, automation destroys the jobs of millions of workers, black and white? I'm sure you would have done it with much more passion and energy and spirit, but I, I, I wanted to end with those words and to thank you all for, for coming out tonight and sharing with us. This is, as, as we said before, a celebration of 50 years of progress. We know that there is so much more to do, as Dr. Ghosh reminds us, and it's going to be each and every one of you who will take the lead, who will use your voice to extend that moral arc 
of justice so that so that Trayvon Martin is not the expectation, so that we don't compare him until Trayvon Martin in 2013, so that black men and Latino boys don't have to worry about walking down the streets of Brooklyn in my neighborhood and been pulled over just for being black. So that every student, no matter who they are, what sport they play, what class they take, come to Wagner College and know that they are here because they are equally as qualified and, and even more talented because of all of their attributes. This is the day that you are ready to take the lead. And I am so proud to be a part of this community, and I'm looking forward to how you, the new leaders, are going to help us move forward. So please join me in thanking Becca Barrett. I don't know why we are drinking Shasta versus Diet Coke, but this is what we have. So we'll make do, we'll make do. This is, we're progressing, we're progressing. So I, I thank you all and have a great rest of the night.